We're continuing our series that we began before Easter, and the series is Witnesses of the Resurrection. I, I also thought uh, it'd be interesting to think in terms of uh, Luke and what he wrote in Acts chapter 1. He says, In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions to the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. That's what we've been looking at for the last several weeks. The witnesses of the resurrection. Evidence, proofs that Jesus has given to us that he's risen from the dead. It took some time. In fact, even the fact that, that several of the disciples did not believe that Jesus was risen from the dead is more evidence that he did rise from the dead. They had to be convinced Thomas, Peter, the other disciples, all of them had to be convinced that Jesus was risen from the dead. Even though he had told them he was going to suffer and die, even though he told them that he would rise in three days, they hadn't gotten it. So when those women came back from the tomb and said, we saw angels and we believe he's risen from the dead, they didn't believe them. Thomas, when the other disciples had seen him on Sunday night uh, and said, he's risen. Thomas said, I'm not going to believe it unless I touch. Judas didn't believe it. Judas goes and hangs himself. There are incredible witnesses that prove that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. And that's what Luke's saying is, that, look, Jesus did everything he could to try to convince us that he was risen from the dead. And I was thinking about that. So how is it that anyone could miss the Messiah? And how did some disciples walking on the road to Emmaus miss the fact that they were walking there with Jesus Christ? So our text for this morning is Luke 24, verses 13 to 35. We're going to read it in parts as we go through it. First, verses 13 to 16. Luke 24. Now, that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were taking, talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. Now, notice this next phrase, because it's really important. But they were kept from recognizing him. They were kept from from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, take note of this next phrase, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to, the, to be sentenced to death. And they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it's the third day since all this took place. Oh, oh they did catch third day, didn't they? It's the third day since all of this took place. In addition... Some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But with him, but him, they did not see. He said to them, well, we'll pick that up in a little bit. How do you miss the Messiah? How do you miss the Messiah when he's walking right there with you? And he's been doing that for three years. Teaching them, talking about the fact that, even, that he was going to die, saying that the Messiah had to suffer and die. Jesus had been actually speaking to them about the various prophecies from the Old Testament for a three-year period of time. 
Remember, there wasn't just the, the conversations with the crowd. There were constant conversations going on between Jesus and the disciples. You, you've got to imagine that there were nighttime gatherings around a fire. There were other times where they'd be walking along the road. And Jesus was continually trying to teach them and prepare them to disciple and equip them for ministry for the future. <clears throat> You have to wonder, though, how did two disciples on their way to Emmaus, a seven-mile seven walk, while talking with Jesus for that almost that entire seven-mile journey, not recognize him? Even later, in describing their feelings as they're walking on that road with Jesus, they said, weren't our hearts burning inside of us? When were we getting this sense of something really special? And yet, what is it? They don't look up and they don't recognize this is Jesus with them. But the key verse there at the beginning of this text is an interesting one. And the verse where it says, <clears throat> but they were kept from recognizing him. Now, there's all kinds of ideas about why did, why did Jesus keep them from recognizing him? You know, and, and in fact, if you think about it, there's been other times like this, weren't there? Doesn't even Jesus say to the disciples, when, who, who do people say that I am? Oh, you're Moses, you're Elijah, you're the prophet. And, well, but then there's that most important question, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. You are the Messiah. Peter gets it. God, Jesus says, you know, God's revealed that to you. See, notice, God has helped Peter to see something that other people aren't seeing yet. How about the blindness of Pharaoh? Didn't God keep Pharaoh from setting the people free? Kept him from honoring and doing what God was asking? In fact, didn't Jesus himself say that some people will see and yet not see? Hear, but they won't hear. Understand things, but they won't understand. And because of their own blindness, they will actually then become more blind. And doesn't God then at some point when the person says, I'm, I'm just going to reject you, God. I don't want anything to do with you. You don't exist. Doesn't at some point then God says, okay, fine. I'm going to go ahead and put the blinders over your eyes. I'm going to stop you from being able to believe because you don't want to believe. Oh, my, that's tragic. Who are these two men? Well, even by reading our text, you start seeing that well, they've had to be close to the other 12 disciples. Are they one of the 12 disciples? Well, none of them is named Cleopas, right? So that, we're not, we don't think that they're one of the 12, but they must have been there close. They've actually been there with the other disciples when they're hearing from the women. The women have come back. Remember that when it says disciples, it's not just the 12 or in this case at this point in time, 11, because Judas has um, killed himself. It's not just the 11, but it's other followers. There were many. Remember, Jesus sent out first the 12 to do ministry. He sent out 72 to do ministry. They would have been disciples. He sent out 120 to do ministry. What did he ask each one of them to do? Simple little things. It, you know, basic Christianity stuff. Preach the kingdom of God is here. That's easy, right? Heal the sick, cast out demons. Basic stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Elementary, you know, when you first week Christian kind of stuff, right? Literally, that's what he was doing. He was sending them out to heal the sick, to cast out demons, and to proclaim the kingdom of God is here. Where? Jesus. So, and the 72, 120, right there is over 200, right? Plus the 12. These are all disciples of Jesus who are close to Jesus, who have been following him, traveling with him, some of them. Remember, there's a whole entourage of people with Jesus, the women who help support him financially. I mean, there's a host of people. And these are followers, close followers, because they were there. They were in the place of hiding where the door was locked, where the other disciples were like, oh, no, where are we going to be? By the way, I was going to try to show a picture of the upper room, and unfortunately my picture had writing on it. And I, but I want you to know that the upper room, if you ever go to Jerusalem, you've got to go to see the upper room because the upper room is not what you would expect. Most of us expect that the upper room would be some kind of little room, maybe like some of our dining rooms, right? If you have a, have a dining room, a room, room enough for maybe a table that might be able to hold six or eight people. 
uh, really tough if you could get 12 around it. It would be almost impossible to get 12 people laying on the ground around your table, right, in your dining room. The room that's the upper room is a room that's bigger than this space here. Bigger than this space here. Uh, ceilings much higher than this space here. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know that when we walked into it, I thought, wow, this is kind of like, this must have been one of those places where you gathered for meetings, right? Where you, you rent the facility <laughs> as, a, as a meeting place, uh, a banquet hall, in other words. And that may have been what it was. And it's quite probable that it wasn't just the 12 disciples that were there for the foot washing and communion and Passover. There had to be other people because somebody had to cook the meal anyways. So there's some number of people. And it's this room where they're now hiding in. Well, easily, there could have been 100 or more people in, in this room. Notice, right now, we can seat 150 people in this space. So how many people were in the upper room? Who knows? And it's very possible that Cleopas and his friend, an unnamed friend, some people say it was Cleopas' wife, we don't know. They're walking back to their little village. Uh, it's a village that's no longer present today, um, <clears throat> but it's called Emmaus. And, and Scripture tells us, translates it, by the way, for us, that it's seven miles outside of Jerusalem, about a three to three and a half hour walk. Excuse me, two to two and a half hour walk out of Jerusalem. Notice what it says. It says, one of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting? You have to kind of hear almost the, the sarcasm from Cleopas. Jesus has just walked up to them. But notice, their heads are down. And even as they're ta talking and discussing things with him, their heads continue to remain down. They're just so discouraged and depressed. They're so brokenhearted that they can't even see what's going around. They can't see the truth. They're right here. Jesus is walking with them. The risen Savior is right there by their side. And they're like, life is so bad. Jesus just died. What do you mean you don't know who this, what just happened? Who, wh who are you anyways? Yeah, haven't you heard Jesus died in Jerusalem today? The priest killed him. He was turned over to Rome. It's, 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 this is a horrible day and on top of it, it's the third day and we've heard the women think that he's risen. Oh, this is terrible. And they're like that. And it's like you're kind of like, saying, look up. We hoped he was going to redeem Israel. We had this belief that, that maybe this really was the one. And notice they used the right word even. They, had, they got it, but they didn't get it. He's the one who's going to redeem Israel. He's the one who's going to pay the price for Israel. He's going to save Israel by purchasing Israel. How's he going to purchase them? The way the scripture all taught about it. He had to purchase them with his death, but that they didn't get. We thought he was going to redeem Israel. Oh, but he's dead. He really seemed like some incredible prophet. The way he taught, but he's dead dead. And they're so focused on their depression, their discouragement, their agony, that they can't see that the hope of heaven is walking right there beside them. And in addition, verse 22, some of our women amazed us. Now, now let's notice, the, 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 I'm, I'm appreciative of this. They don't, Cleopas doesn't say, and some of our stupid women think he's arrived. And, no, they actually amazed us. They, they amazed us. Remember, this is part of, a, again, evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you're going to tell a story that's false, you don't have women tell it because they're not legitimate witnesses in that day. They couldn't even go to court and be a witness. And so this, it, this has to be true because only God would say, hey, ladies, you're the ones who get to announce it. You're the first ones who get to see me risen from the dead. Hey, ladies, I'm changing this world in a way that the world doesn't even understand. They've amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Uh, so why don't they believe it? Well, first off, because it's ladies. <laughs> Secondly, <laughs> I'm sorry, they, they didn't believe women. 
Secondly, they didn't understand. They didn't understand what Jesus had been teaching about the resurrection. And thirdly, they'd seen a few people brought back from the dead, including a very special friend of theirs named Lazarus, Jairus' daughter, among others. But Jesus, the miracle worker, had done that. And now he's dead. So who's going to do it? David Gooding sums up these words. He says, death and resurrection form no part of their concept of Messiah's office and program, which is why they had not really taken in what Jesus had said about his coming death. In their view, death was not what the Messiah would do. They were hoping for a Messiah who would break the imperialist domination by the Romans by force of arms. A Messiah who managed to allow himself to be caught by Jewish authorities, handed over to the Romans and crucified before he had even begun to organize any guerrilla operations. A liberator who should not die, but be triumphant. Jesus was already disqualified because he had died. After that, it was the most irrelevant. It was almost irrelevant to talk about resurrection but they didn't get it now notice what jesus does jesus as he's walking along there their heads still bowed they're still not seeing and he says but don't you know that look the messiah had to suffer and so verse 25 he said to them how foolish you are how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken did not the messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning whom? Do you see it in your text? Concerning himself. Jesus rebukes them. It's interesting. It's not the kind of words you usually tell people to use when you're at a graveside (laughs) or when you're talking to somebody who's really grieving. You're not supposed to be feeling that way. That's not a really good way to comfort somebody, is it? But he says, look, you're wrong. They're walking along, and he's saying, you're wrong. He rebukes them for their knowledge of the Scripture or their lack thereof. They didn't believe that the Messiah had to suffer. How foolish you are. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explains this to them. You see, they have a partial understanding of Scripture. It's not complete. They've heard it. They've read the passages. They probably studied them word for word, but they've missed what those passages have said. So the two of them are heading home back to Emmaus, convinced that their dream is dead and Jesus is not the Messiah. Robert Deffenbaugh talked about this. He said, the reason these two men viewed their circumstances with despair was because they did not view them from God's point of view. They did not judge their circumstances spiritually. When viewed biblically, everything that had happened was a part of God's plan, which included not only the suffering and death of Messiah, but also his resurrection. Finite fallen men need the word of God if they are to recognize the hand of God in history. The message of the prophets was that the Messiah was going to suffer and experience glory. Isaiah 53, 3 to 5, he is despised and rejected by men. See, doesn't this sound like somebody's going to suffer? A man of what? Sorrows and acquainted with grief. And, And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he bore our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. That sounds like someone who is supposed to suffer. Isaiah 55, verses 5 through 7. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious, nor did I turn away. I gave my back to those who struck me. 
and my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting, for the Lord God will help me. Therefore, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I will be, will not be ashamed. It's Daniel 9.26 says the Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. It's Zechariah 12.10. They'll look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. Israel understood that these passages were about the Messiah, and yet they didn't get it. These very disciples walking on the road with Jesus who have heard him teach about this, didn't get it when he preached and when he taught them and when he quoted these passages. And here they are walking back to Emmaus, totally brokenhearted, depressed and discouraged, and they still don't get it. Jesus is standing right there with them. And you can go look at other texts. Let me just read off them. Deuteronomy 18, 15, Psalm 2, Psalm 16, Psalm 22. It's the one he quotes as he's hanging there from the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Psalm 118, Exodus 20, Psalm 146, Daniel 9. And there's so many passages that Jesus has already explained to them, yet they didn't get it. Verse 30, Luke 24. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. And they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while we talked, while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Notice it's the intimacy of fellowship that causes them to recognize who Jesus is. It's as he sits down and eats with them and he breaks the bread. That's as they're doing that, that then God says, let me now open up your eyes so you can see who I am. And then Jesus reveals himself to them. Notice how the importance of fellowship in God's eyes That's a part of the way we get revelation from God is by our connecting to one another as well as to him. The the Bible also is the other piece of this. Notice, what, what is Jesus using as he's walking along this road? Seven mile journey, two and a half hours with these two guys. Don't they ever look up? And he's, and oh man, he's really speaking to us and he's saying some things and he's really kind of beating them up even. Then he's, what's he using? He's using the word of God, which he knows because he is the word of God. Then he's sharing those things with them. And the Bible is critical for our understanding, but there's something else that also is necessary. What happens to cause them to be able to see? It's not only the fellowship, it's the Holy Spirit that now finally opens up their eyes. It's the Holy Spirit that helps them to see. This is Jesus right here. And then he leaves. (laughs) Wait a second. We just just saw you. We just recognized you. And then he's gone. Think about it. Why did Jesus do this? Because he wants them to understand that the scriptures have this incredible truth within them. And as Jesus is walking along there, he's not teaching as the Christ. He's teaching from the word about Christ. It's not till they get to the table and they sit down and they eat the bread that now suddenly he reveals himself as the Christ. But on the journey, he wants them to see everything is there for you to be able to know and understand who I am. Everything, in fact, it's been presented to you already and let me tell it to you again. These are the things that will help you to recognize Christ, the Messiah. And then I will now show you, here I am, I'm right here in front of you. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and he opened the scriptures to us? And they got up, and they returned at once to Jerusalem. And there they found the eleven, and those with them assembled together, and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared. What else do you think Jesus said to them on that road? 
He may have started with Genesis chapter 3. Think about it. What did he say right back there? That the word was going to come alive and that the seed of woman, that Satan would bruise his heel, but the son of woman would bruise, would actually destroy the head of Satan. He must have talked to him about the blessings that Abraham was going to give to all the nations. I'm sure he had to say, describe himself as Hebrews does, as the high priest after the order of Melchizedek. He talked about God, how he had wrestled with Jacob, and then how the tribe of Judah had been selected as the tribe from which the king would ultimately come. I'm sure he discussed the burning bush and how Moses questioned things as well and doubted who that was. And he talked about the prophet who was greater than Moses. He had to share with them about, remember, the Passover lamb. We're in the week of that and the significance of the Passover lamb. He had to talk about the captain of the Lord's army for, who led Joshua into the battles and gave them Israel. I'm sure he talked about the kinsman redeemer who redeemed Ruth from, from her pain. He talked about the son of David who was a king greater than David. Surely he talked about the suffering savior of Psalm 22, the good shepherd of Psalm 23, the wisdom of Proverbs and the lover of the song of Solomon, the savior described in the prophets and the suffering servant of Isaiah 53, which I read earlier. And of course he talked about the princely Messiah that Daniel describes. He shared with them the truth. And the question that hits me today, not only did they fail to see it was Jesus with them, but do we fail to see Jesus with us? We want proof that God's speaking to us. We want proof that Jesus is by our side. We want evidence, even of the resurrection, that, that God's hearing our prayers. And, and, and maybe we're at just as weak a place as these two disciples walking on the road back to Emmaus. And we're so caught up in our circumstances and the things that we're facing that we fail to see that Jesus, the Messiah, is right there with us. Yes, and if you think about it, maybe one of the reasons why we fail to see is because of our own rejection of what he has said. And so he gives us certain vital instructions. Love God with your whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. And we're more committed to ourselves. Love your neighbor as yourself. And we don't give time to our neighbor. And so the basic things that Jesus wanted us to learn and hear and do even today, we fail to do. And because of that, we fail to see that Jesus is with us. Daryl Bach from InterVarsity Press says, here's the major lesson of the Emmaus Road experience. Though resurrection is hard to believe, be assured it took place. Its reality means that Jesus' claims are true. He was more than a teacher, more than a prophet. He was the promised, anointed one of God. A host of skeptics saw that this was so, and they believed. Do not be skeptical as these men were. Remember what God required of his Messiah, suffering, then vindication in exaltation. It was Henry Martin, the great missionary to India, who said, now let me burn out for God. His heart was set on fire by the truth of Scripture. Or David Brainerd, the young missionary to the American Indians who died in his youth, said, Oh, that I were a flame of fire in the hand of God. And it was John Wesley at the time of his conversion who said, My heart was strangely warmed. Have you allowed God, the Spirit of God, to burn inside of you with an excitement, a passion, because Jesus is risen. Are you just focused on, oh yeah, I think I know it already. I know the stuff, I know the Bible, but have you missed seeing 
Have you failed to see that right there as you're looking down, Jesus is right there with you? Oh, may God reveal himself to you. May he open up our eyes. Folks, this is not just for the unbeliever, is it? This is for the disciple, the follower, the committed man and woman of God for us to not fail to see that Jesus Christ is with us. Oh God, open our eyes. <laughs> Even now as we close them, open our hearts, open our eyes, burn within us that, that, that hunger, that thrill, that, that, that anointing of your spirit that gives us that sense, yes, God is here with me. God is speaking to me. I'm not alone. And Lord, forgive us when we get so focused on our circumstances. We are so mindful of our activity, the schedule of things we have to do, the struggles that we are facing, the challenges that are on our mind, the burdens that are depressing us, the, 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 just the life situations that are taking its toll on us, God. And because of all of that, our eyes aren't open enough, our heads are down, and we can't see. Forgive us, God, when that happens. Spirit of God, show yourself to each person here today and especially to the ones whose eyes are so downcast or frankly, Lord, to the eyes that are so much on their own feelings and circumstances that they're failing to see you and your hand of blessing right there with them. In Jesus' name, amen.